this yeah. morning. The clock is now ticking yeah. on the 10 day window that former President Trump and his 18 co defendants have to voluntarily turn themselves in. Can you imagine this? No, I, 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 it, it's really. It, Peter Baker actually wrote a great article talking about how what once was just unthinkable is now becoming, well, Tuesday. Uh, and, it's actually and, Wednesday and at so, this point. so, Peter, I'm old enough. I don't think you are, but I'm old enough, and, and, and several people on the show are old enough. We remember exactly where we were on August the 9th, uh, 1974. I was driving in my grandmom's Dodge Dart uh, into a... <laughs> I think it's Strip Mall in upstate New York, in Horseheads, New York. Wow. And uh, the news came on uh, radio talking about Richard Nixon resigning yeah. from the White House. It was massive. Now, I have no doubt that, uh, that history will record these four indictments as, as uh, spectacularly out of the ordinary and, and perhaps um, for better or worse, uh, to be monumental events in American history, especially constitutional history. But you're right, though. Right now, we're in the middle of the storm, and these 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 shocks just keep coming. But like like Trump, uh, shocking but not surprising. Yeah, no, exactly. That's my first memory, too. Actually, my first political memory is my dad holding up the paper, wow. which said the giant block letters, Nixon resigns, and talking about what that meant for the country. And and you're right, we are in a historic moment now. We often don't think about it when we are living history, but we are living history. And this uh, has great consequence for the country. We don't know where it's going to go, but you're right, there's a certain surreal quality to the idea that, yeah, another week, another indictment, here we go again. It's sort of lost some of the novelty or shock value. We should be shocked. It's shocking to see a president charged with a crime. Uh, certainly, uh, assuming you, you, if you think he's guilty, it's shocking. If you think he's being unfair Fairly charged. That's shocking in its own way, of course. But here we've got 91 felony charges, four different jurisdictions, God. four different cases, uh, and that's four trials that are coming up in the next year. Let's say, assuming the dates get set. Plus, by the way, and we, let's not forget he's got a few other civil trials coming up as well. So this is going to be a professional defendant at a time when he's trying to get back into the White House. And it's just there's no roadmap for this. There's nothing to compare it to. Nothing to compare it to. And, you know, it's very interesting, Jonathan O'Meara. I'm starting to see from people who have uh, steadfastly defended Donald Trump all along. And, of course, they've done that. If they're not pro-Trump, they're anti-anti-Trump. But you're now actually seeing some columnists, even in the New York Post, saying, hey, come on. Come on. Yes, this is all the Democrats' fault. Yes, this is this. Yeah, and they'll go through and they'll attack prosecutors. But, you know, somebody like Dan McLaughlin will say, come on. Come on, Republicans, don't fall for this again. Democrats put up like 50, Demo 50 Republican candidates last year that denied elections and Republicans that were suckers. They fell for it. Mm -hmm. And every one of them lost in all of the all of the big races. Don't do it again. And then at the end, he concedes like I'm seeing more and more people concede. Prosecutors aren't perfect, but Trump brought this on himself for the most part. There really does seem to be uh, sort of that reality sinking in, even among the most steadfast, hardy, anti-anti-Trumpers. Yeah, that does seem to be breaking through a little bit. There was a telling moment on, on Fox yesterday where Neil Cavuto asked his pro-Trump guest, really, you think all of these are, you know, all of these cases are, are biased? All of these cases are politically motivated? Really? All of them? And it just defies logic. There's so much here. There's so much. And, and Donald Trump is now staring at a 2024 where he's going to be hurtling and shuttling between courtroom to rally date. And there is a sense, as much as he has whipped up his core base of supporters, and he has, like, the, the, his base is with him and they're not going anywhere. They believe everything he is saying. That other polling suggests, though Trump is way ahead of the field, but there's a, some of that support is a little bit soft, and that there's a fear among some Republicans that that Trump, even if they like Trump, even if they think he is being railroaded somewhat, they just think it's too much. They're fatigued, but more than that, the baggage will prevent him from winning again. And that's what I hear from Republicans here in Washington. Even those who are publicly for Trump, privately they're concerned they're heading for a repeat of 2022, where if Trump's at the top of the ticket, he's going to bring the rest of the party down with him. It's going to hurt them with independent, with swing voters as they try to win back the Senate, as they try to hold on the House, particularly in seats that President Biden won last time around. That They think that this will be another election where Trump is going to be a net 
negative for the party. And as much as it's helping in the primaries right mm -hmm. now, it is hard to make the case that this is going to that those voters are going to break his way next year as the criminal allegations just continue to pile up. And as the White House tells you, uh, and as you've reported, they understand, the White House understands that Georgia is a swing state earlier than they ever expected for one reason. Yeah. And his name is Donald Trump. And you look at these indictments and you also look at Georgia. There is a Republican civil war, political civil war going on in Georgia. Yesterday, you had the governor of Georgia oh, yeah. immediately after Donald Trump said, I'm going to hold a press conference to show how Georgia was rigged and the voting was rigged. Immediately afterwards, uh, Brian Kemp tweeted out that it's not true. He said this. Go ahead, Mika, tell the us. The 2020 election in Georgia was not stolen. For nearly three years now, anyone with evidence of fraud has failed to come forward under oath and prove anything in a court of law. Our elections in Georgia are secure, accessible, and fair, and will continue to be as long as I am governor. The future of our country is at stake in 2024, and that must be our focus. And then, of course, Brad Raffensperger said the most basic principles of a strong democracy our accountability and respect for the Constitution and rule of law. You either have it or you don't. And if you look, those are two, those are the two most powerful Republican leaders in the state of Georgia. I heard somebody mistakenly say they barely squeaked by uh, in 2022 for election. No, they won in a landslide. And, and, and they won in a landslide uh, in the Republican primary. And, and so, Jennifer Palmieri, you have, and you know this, and I know this. I think Kemp, Kemp's tweet going after Donald Trump's BS claims was so shocking when it came out as quickly as it came out, the timing Just of when no. it came out, because he didn't have to do it. He didn't have to do it then. I would say 99% of politicians would have sat back and said, eh, it's Trump. Let's just let it play out a little bit. No, he went out of his way. The governor, the Republican governor of Georgia, where this case is going to be tried, went out of his way to say, Donald Trump's lying. And the secretary of state said, this guy, he doesn't respect the Constitution of the United States. You either respect it or you don't. I thought it was extraordinarily telling, and it talks about that divide now among uh, Republicans. And I must say, when I talked to Greg Bluestein yesterday, I said, boy, it must be, you know, it must be really heated down there. And why are they doing this in Fulton County? They should do it in, in another district. And Greg said, well, that's where the crimes took place in Fulton County. He goes, but this isn't just a Democratic thing in Georgia. There are a lot of Republicans that are incredibly angry at what Donald Trump did in 2020 and how he keeps losing the Senate for Georgia Republicans. The, you know, you, I watched the show yesterday and you had a great colloquy. Can you have a colloquy between three people? I'm not sure, but you I and John Meacham and John. Is that right? I was in terms of a two-person thing. You're the former member of Congress, <laughs> you would know. Um, but between you, you and Heilman and John Meacham about Republicans and why they won't, why they won't have the courage to, to push back and why they continue to accept Trump or, you know, pick their, pick their moments when they are willing to take him on. And, you know, Georgia is just such an interesting case because Brian Kemp and Brad Raffensperger show that you can do this. I can't think of I mean, Doug mm -hmm. Ducey, the former governor of Arizona. He did this to some degree. He stood up to Trump, um, famously refused to take his phone call as he was certifying Arizona's votes, but not in the way that uh, Brian Kemp and Brad Raffensperger really defended Georgia, really took on Trump. And like you said, they won they won big, and the huge, Republicans huge they won huge. They won wins huge in the GOP. And, you know, uh, Kelly Loeffler, who was briefly a senator from Georgia, ran for re ran for election in 2020. David Perdue, who was senator from uh, Georgia, he primaried Brian Kemp. They all backed Trump. They all lost. The other Republicans who uh, who, you know, backed up Trump on his claims that he lost 20, the 2020 that he won the 2020 election, they're now indicted. But 
Raffensperger and Kemp show that there is a way to do this if you do it with integrity. And, you know, these two, as much as progressive laud them for what they have done to protect democracy, they're conservative Republicans. So they still win in um, they still win in these in these primaries. But it shows there is a way to stand up to Trump within his own party. All right. We want to. So, and meanwhile, two of Trump's challengers in the 2024 Republican primary were asked yesterday about the latest indictment for the former president. They're now doing an inordinate amount of resources uh, to try to shoehorn this contest over the 2020 election into a RICO statute, which was really designed to be able to go after organized crime, uh, not necessarily to go after uh, political activity. And so uh, I think it's an example uh, of this criminalization of politics. Uh, I don't think that this is something that, that's good for the country. We all heard that phone call with the former president, then president at the time, where he said, just find me the requisite number of votes that I would need. Doesn't that feel anti-American? Doesn't that feel like not what a president should do? Well, we should continue to say it as I see it, which is that we see the legal system being weaponized against political opponents. That is un-American and unacceptable. And at the end of the day, uh, we need a better system than that. And I frankly hope to be the president of the United States where we have an opportunity to restore confidence and integrity in all of our departments of justice yeah, in the country. Yeah, but that phone call, you heard it, right? Yes, but I, I, we've just draw different conclusions. And next question. You would fine. You would do that as president. You would look for the amount of votes. He do, he doesn't want to answer the wow. question. What's he doesn't want to answer the question. You you can't if if I you're willing if you're willing to sit back and excuse somebody trying to steal an election, calling a Republican Secretary of State who says he was trying to get me to throw out votes. That's what a Republican secretary of state said and a Republican governor said. And then you sit there and you claim, oh, they're politicizing the process. They're weaponizing the process. You're, you're, just, you're not fit to be president of the United States. That's just really, it's really disgusting. And, you know, I like Tim Scott and I, I think he's talented. A, a, a really talented, talented, talented guy. I really, and people ask me, who could be, who do you think could win the nomination if Trump and DeSantis falls straight. I go, Tim Scott. Tim Scott makes it. Not if he does that. Not if he does that. Jim Palmieri, it's so maddening. They keep talking about the weaponization, the weaponization of the Justice Department. Donald Trump steals nuclear secrets. He lies to the DOJ about turning everything back. He lies about everything. He sends his workers to try to destroy video surveillance tape that shows him moving those documents around with top secret classified military secrets about nuclear weapons, attacks against Iran, America's weaknesses. And they go, oh, he's, he's, just, he's just trying to politicize the process. He tries to steal votes from millions of Americans by setting up fraudulent electors to replace electors who actually represent the millions of people that did vote in those seven swing states. And they go, oh, it's a, they keep pointing at that ghastly, dangerous Merritt Garland. Are you kidding me? Merritt Garland. And they keep looking right past the guy who stole nuclear secrets, allegedly, the guy who stole military secrets, I'll still say allegedly, even though they've got him dead to right on that. All of these things. And it's, it's like, like seriously, when, when are you going to when are you going to when are you going to get serious so about sad. running for president of the United States and telling the truth about the guy you're running against? It's like it feels like I mean, what you see happening in Iowa, it feels like a fantasy football league, right? Like you can make your arguments that you're making. You might even win Iowa. You might, somebody might even beat Donald Trump in Iowa, but it has no bearing on what's actually happening. The like the stakes of what's of how democracy is actually under threat and probably also a little bearing on who ultimately is going to become president of the United States. You know, it really struck me when DeSantis said Rico was created to go after organized crime. Yes. 
Yes, it was. And that's why it's being used here, because it was a organized crime that Trump and his allies uh, uh, committed. And, you know, you see Rudy Giuliani talking about the same thing. You see the disdain that they have for what Trump did, because Rudy Giuliani said, well, this isn't supposed to be used. RICO's not supposed to be used for election disputes, as if, you know, as if what happened wasn't just trying to thwart the sort of fundamental um, principle of what the American Republic stands for. Um, the, the sort of callousness with which Republicans have treated this issue, I feel it is, you know, alongside the history that's being made with the indictments, we're going to look back on mm -hmm. those words and words like Tim, what, what Tim Scott, who otherwise seems to be a very honorable, very, you know, as you all said, really talented politician, um, will be marked in history as as you know, if we saw this happen in another country, we saw an, another leader being from, you know, this is Berlusconi ish, right? Um, going right. through these kinds of uh, these kinds of trials and politicians continuing to back up the person who so clearly violated this fundamental precept of the of the republic. You know, what would we what would we think of that country? Yeah, I mean, I mean John exactly. Lemire from from stealing and, and they all know he did it. Yeah. They all say it off camera. They all say it off camera. They know he stole nuclear secrets and will tell you that off camera. And they know he tried to steal an election. And a lot of them, like Tim Scott, actually had to run for their lives and hunker down because the mob that Donald Trump sent their way could have killed them. Could have killed them. And but for the work of some capital uh, uh, cops, there's some, there's some senators who probably would have been killed by these riots. So they know the truth, and yet they lie about somebody stealing nuclear secrets and trying to steal American democracy from them, from them, from us. It's just, again, it's, uh, there's no looking past that. No, there are lies in these bad faith attacks, the, the what about isms, trying to say about, well, the two tiered you know, system of justice, Biden's DOJ, and of course the Hunter Biden matter, which they latch on to each and every day as their go to talking point, instead of confronting Donald Trump, the man they're trying to beat uh, in these primaries. They're simply not doing it. Exactly. Not yeah, not even not even because they're criticizing his behavior, because they've apparently decided that would alienate too many of his voters, but even That's to make point. the electability argument. They're not even doing that to say, hey, he can't win. And to our earlier conversation, yeah, there are those close to President Biden who think that if, if any other Republican emerges as the GOP nominee, the president probably can't win Georgia this time around. Georgia's not quite there yet for Democrats. But if it's Trump, they like their chances. So Several of the attorneys who represented Donald Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election were never paid for their work. What? It doesn't pay anybody. I mean, seriously, so did, did, like, seriously, did they not know this going in? They're just so excited to be with him. Like, did, did they, like, are they like now going, oh my God, he, you mean he- What? Doesn't he doesn't pay? pay? You mean the great pumpkin doesn't rise from the pumpkin it patch? It doesn't. Every Halloween evening to that give- That big orange pumpkin. Candy to- Good okay, boys so and girls? <laughs> this latest news is according to testimony from congressional investigators and federal election commission records. Not only were they not compensated. Wait, but, but, but he stole $250 million from his supporters. You're so dumb. And he lied to his supporters that this was to stop the steal. He raised a quarter of a billion dollars and he did not pay them? Not only were they not compensated. I feel like we can have, we can make fun of this a little bit. You know, I don't like it when Donald Trump has taken advantage of people. Well, it's like the Jim and Tammy Faye Baker thing. I always said about my grandma. Yeah. There are innocents in this. These are not one of them. Uh, these lawyers. These lawyers, no. Anyhow, um, not only were they not compensated, their lawsuits and false claims helped the Trump campaign and allies raise $250 million. As CNBC reports, among those who were stiffed, Trump's closest ally, Rudy Giuliani. The records show that Giuliani's companies were only reimbursed for travel and not the $20,000 a day he requested to be paid. That's a whole other story. Yeah, but I've got to $20,000 say, a day? I've got to say, Giuliani may not have gotten paid for his work with Donald Trump 
after the, the election. But he did get indicted. So there's that. Six of one, half dozen of the other. But David French, I always talk about the, uh, you know, how my grandma would send her Social Security checks, sadly, even though we, my parents tried to intervene, to Jim and Tammy Faye Baker while they were building mm -hmm. their, their massive multi-million dollar scam operation out of Char in, in Charlotte, uh, North Carolina. Um, and here, I mean, we've seen... We've seen Steve Bannon sent to jail uh, or, or at least arrested for his phony scheme to raise, I don't know, $10 million or whatever to build the wall. I find it hard to believe that Jack Smith doesn't come back later with a superseding indictment that doesn't go after this $250 billion million that Donald Trump fraudulently raised claiming the election was rigged when he knew it wasn't rigged. I mean, that's, that seems to be, that would have been the first crime I would have brought as a prosecutor because it would have been the easiest to prove. Well, believe it or not, it's probably going to be easier to prove the, the crimes that Smith has already charged than that one. I mean, there's going to be a lot of latitude when you're raising money for a campaign, for a cause. You've got a lot of latitude in how you spend those dollars. And so, it's actually going to be easier to do what Jack Smith did in the absence of smoking guns regarding fraudulent intent, for example, say in the fundraising. It's going to be a lot easier to do what Smith did. He did that that sort of instead of the shotgun blast indictment, he did much more of the rifle shot right. indictment, narrowly focused on the specific claims related to the uh, the effort to overturn the election. I think he wants to get to trial on this matter as soon as he possibly can. And the more he lards up his indictment of Trump, the slower that case is going to proceed. So I, I might be a little, you know, could be wrong, but I might be a little bit surprised if he throws anything else, you know, into the stew in this court, in, in this case in D.C. Let's bring it right now, Democratic uh, Senator from New York, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. Uh, Mr. Majority Leader, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, just... I, I think if you want to, to sum up the economy right now and how bogus the attacks are against uh, against what what Joe Biden and 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 Senate is, have done to help the economy along. All you have to do is look at what the economists right now, as of yesterday, most economists fear the most in the future. And it's two things. One, the China's economy is weakening too quickly. And that will have right. impact on exports, imports. And two, that the United States economy is too strong. Not making this up. China's is too weak. America's is too strong. And they're afraid it's going to grow, keep growing so fast that we're going to have inflation again because it's so robust. I mean, these are problems. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's remarkable how resilient our economy is, isn't it? It is. Our economy is doing so well, and it's in good part because of the work we in the Senate and the president did uh, over the last summer. The infrastructure bill, the chips and science bill, and today we're celebrating the one-year anniversary of the IRA. Probably the most significant pieces of legislation that's been passed since the, since the Great Society. And let's just go over what they do. I mean, first, it's the most significant reduction in the amount of carbon going into the atmosphere, the most significant climate legislation we have ever had, uh, a 40 percent reduction by 2030. But that's creating millions of new green jobs, whether it's opening an electric battery factory or, as in Wisconsin, making the turbines. And, you know, when a, when a parent knows their kid, their son or daughter gets a job in one of these industries, they say, that's lasting a long time. That's on into the future. These are good paying jobs. We also reduced costs. For the first time, we were able to go after pharma. We got no help from the Republicans. Insulin's $35. Starting in January, no one's going to pay more than $3,000 out of their pocket for prescription drugs. A year later, it'll go down to $2,000. That's a huge cost reduction, as is the cost of buying an appliance, remodeling your home in a green, green way, getting uh, heat, heat conductors. All of these things are going to have lower costs. And at the same time, we did raise some taxes on the very wealthy, the corporations who didn't pay, and put half of that
that money into inflation reduction. Republicans always talk about, you know, the deficit, but they always increase it by just cutting taxes on the wealthy. We did just the opposite. So this is a huge bill now. Is it on the lips of everybody? No. But just what you saw yesterday in Wisconsin mm. is happening every week in so many of the states. Ribbons are being cut as bridges are being rebuilt. Factories are opening. New jobs. People are learning lower costs to the prescription drugs. We're finally negotiating uh, with the drug companies. And it's going to take persistence. And this is what I say to my uh, fellow uh, Democrats in the Senate. We got to keep at this week after week after week. Every week a new thing happens, and it will, by the year from now, people will know. They will know the economy is strong. You know, Joe, you mentioned um, the economy is strong, but it's often a lagging indicator. People still remember six, mm -hmm. eight months ago where things are at, but by next summer they won't. They will see just the things that you have, and, and the economy will be a strong suit for us. And let's finally compare it to the Republicans. We're investing. They're investigating. All they seem to do is want to investigate this, that, and the other thing. That doesn't help the American people. Well, the contrast of yesterday, I, yeah. <laughs> a former president being indicted for trying to um, deny an election, and this president today talking about investing in America, that's going to sink in, and it's our job to make sure it sinks in. Well, I mean, their investigations are just so patently stupid. I'm embarrassed for them. I mean, they're, they, you know, they're talking to they, arms they also, dealers you know, and people that illegally smuggle, that illegally smuggle Iranian oil to the Communist Chinese Party. They, they, they talk about <laughs> tapes in the FBI. And then Grassley gives up the game and says, well, we don't care whether he's guilty or not. I could go down the list. Now, I've got a lot of people who want to ask you questions. And if they want to ask questions okay, about the but economy, I just make that's one fine. Point. These I, investigations... I, I, yeah, go ahead. Right. These investigations, they don't matter to the average American people. This is the right wing, the hard right wing talking to each other. Let them keep talking to each yeah. other. We're talking to talking the American to themselves. people. Talking to themselves. So, so, Senator, I want to talk about an issue that is especially uh, personal to me, uh, because when I, as you know, we work together in Congress and I represented a district uh, that had five military bases. And and uh, my job was to go to Washington and do several things. Uh, but one was obsess over military readiness. And um, I, I every time I'd go to the Pentagon or every time a general or an admiral or a colonel would come and talk to me in my office or armed services, they'd all say, have your fights about social policies outside of, of, of this this hearing room. Let's focus on the readiness of the United States Armed Forces. We have one senator, a Republican from Alabama, mm -hmm. who right now is responsible for the Marine Corps not having a commandant for the first time in 150 years, the Navy not having uh, somebody leading them, the Army not having somebody uh, that, that, that's been uh, supported by the Senate leading them. And it, all the military uh, is saying this is a real readiness problem. Even people in Alabama are against what Tuberville is doing. How do we break the right. impasse? Why won't Republicans stand up and speak out for the good of the men and women who risk their lives in uniform? You know, Republicans have always prided themselves on being the national security party. And yet, that's right, they are letting Tuberville do this. If their whole caucus, the rest of them, said, stop, we, got, we demand you stop, um, he, he would have to stop. Now, McConnell and Thune have said what he's doing is wrong, but that's it. Let me tell you, the power of a leader is enormous. If one of my Democrats was doing this, I'd call him into my office and I'd say, you are going to stop doing this or you're going to pay a price. And there are a lot of ways a leader can make you pay that price. McConnell has not done mm -hmm. this with Tuberville. So as part of the responsibility for this, even though he does care about national security, is on his shoulders. He ought to do it. I will tell you this. Pressure is mounting. As you said, even in Alabama, Tuberville is learning uh, that the people, the, mil the people in his own military bases are being upset about what he's doing. And I think he's going to have to back off, but only because Republicans will put pressure on him. And to do it to prevent a woman 
who, is dre who has been enlisting in our armed services and is serving in a state where she can't get her own health care or right to abortion, to say that she must not do that um, and then hold all of this up for national security? I got to tell you, the Republican Party knows it's a loser for them. It's a loser substantively because of national security. It's a loser politically. But they seem paralyzed against these far-right people, and they're going to have to stand up to them or, um, you know, the country is going to be going to be much, much worse off. And, and frankly, I don't think it's a winning strategy for them. Why did they're trying to do so much? And the only thing is the Democrats have done even worse, but they control the House and all that. And so they can do that to Trump. Why did he get indicted? Because the Democrats don't like him. I guess I really don't know. They're just trying to dig up stuff so they can bring it up so that he doesn't run again. Because he's not a politician, he is a businessman. They don't want him out there again. Why has he been indicted? Uh, just for different allegations. I just think the Democrats are coming after him so they can get him out of the election. Okay, well, um... Hey, all right. Well... I did the Red Sox one last night. Yankees having trouble. I'm just, I'm going to let that pass by. It, it, you know, no, actually, you can't. You know, the, th the thing is, the thing is, people, you, what, what I find is people will tell me, oh, I don't look at the news anymore because it's so biased. But and I they say, think well, they do. I say, well, what about, why don't you read Murdoch's Wall Street Journal? They've got a great news section. Why, why don't you? They give it, they, and and so they'll say, uh, are, are the AP or Reuters or whatever, they're like, oh, no, 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 I, I don't get any news. And then you find out that, you know, they're, 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 they're reading Facebook posts that people uh, that, that people typed up uh, while they're sitting on the toilet or something. And instead of uh, 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 instead of news articles where you have. Uh, I'm just saying there's no there's no I mean, there's uh, no test. Uh, there's there are no editors. There's no no balance. So. They say, oh, I don't follow news anymore, but they will go to conspiracy websites that are run by Chinese religious cults. They, instead of the Wall Street Journal, run, you know, it's a Rupert, again, a Rupert Murdoch thing, hardly or this conspiracy. Trump's platforms, yeah. where he has family members delivering disinformation yeah. for hours and hours so anyway, on a loop. So, so anyway, you know, I, 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 what, what can you say other than I, I'm going to pray for him? And despite the president's, ex-president's multiple indictment uh, during a visit to Battleground, Wisconsin, President Biden focused on the economy and focused on his signature legislation, which I'm sure not a single person interviewed has any idea of all the things that were passed that will actually make their lives the better. President this president and his allies have said for now more than two and a half years and continue to insist to this very hour, the Georgia election was not stolen and I had no right to overturn the election on January 6th. It's a hard truth. My friend Governor Brian Kemp said it well yesterday. He said, for quote, for nearly three years, anyone with evidence of fraud has failed to come forward to provide evidence in a court of law regarding the Georgia elections. That was former vice president and current Republican presidential candidate Mike Pence addressing for the first time the Georgia indictment of Donald Trump. He made those comments moments ago during his address to the National Conference of State Legislatures in Indianapolis. So, so Jonathan O'Meara, some might say that, oh, that's, that's an easy thing for him to say. No, I mean, if you're running for president in a Republican field where 91% of, of, of the people whose votes you're trying to get don't think Donald Trump did anything wrong, then being that direct uh, is actually quite something, just like uh, Brian Kemp yesterday tweeting something that he didn't have to tweet. I mean, there are a thousand different ways that they both could have said it without being that direct. Uh, so I think we should tip our hat when, when people actually say the very things we're saying they should say all along. Yeah, what Kemp and Pence did should be the norm. We shouldn't have to single it out and applaud it. 
But we must, because so few of their fellow Republicans do that. So few Republican rank-and-file voters believe that Joe Biden was duly elected president. They have been so warped by the big lie. They choose to believe it. And yes, and Pence in particular, this is someone who stood up to Trump in the 11th hour of his administration on January 5th, said, no, I won't on January 6th do what you want me to do uh, after that historic consultation with Dan Quayle, uh, and has stayed consistent on that ever since. And I know he's frustrated some who says he should have been more forceful, but Pence has really found his voice in recent months on this as these trials have started up. And he has been clear and plain that he believes he did the right thing and that Donald Trump did not have the right to do what he tried. So under Georgia law, the identities of the 23 grand jurors who reviewed the evidence and testimony in the case against Trump are not secret. The Washington Post reports, in fact, the names of the Fulton County jurors are listed on page nine of the 98-page indictment released late Monday. The law, which is aimed at bringing transparency to criminal proceedings, does not give judges options to protect the privacy of jurors, experts said, even in a high-profile case like Trump's indictment that could expose them to intense scrutiny or even threats. The paper continues. Names of jurors popped up in pro-Trump extremist forums as supporters weighed the benefits of digging into jurors' lives against the risks that it would backfire. So, Lisa, I, I again go back to his public statements, his continued public statements. If he calls it a witch hunt or if he calls it whatever, he uh, continues to say the election was not stolen by him or that he wasn't trying to steal the election. I mean... Isn't that in a secondary way threatening the lives of anyone trying to hold him to accountability? Mika, you're right that every time he contests the legitimacy of these prosecutions, he is indirectly urging people to take action against those who have been involved from large to small, whether it's Jack Smith or any one of these 23 individual grand jurors listed on page nine of the Georgia indictment. I think in order to tamp down on his speech rights, the judges here are going to require something more direct, less ambiguous than if they're coming for me, they're coming for you, or this is a witch hunt, this is corrupt. But to the extent that he crosses that line, I have no doubt that Tanya Chutkin or even Scott McAfee, who's the judge in Fulton County who has been assigned this case, will take whatever measures necessary to protect the integrity of the processes before them. And I trust that the rule of law will prevail. And, and you bring up or you bring a good point, Mika. And I, I agree, Lisa, the rule of law will prevail. At the same time, uh, there are people that, that Donald Trump, uh, Donald Trump and Donald Trump supporters. Anyone uh, see January 6th uh, happen? Well, yeah, uh, that put, put their lives in danger, whether it's January 6th, whether it's poll workers that Rudy Giuliani lied about, uh, talking about the threats, people coming to their house. Uh, them not people indicted. Uh, again, yeah, and, and you look at what happened. What the Trump people were trying uh, for a lady from from what was reported uh, that they were trying to get the names of the FBI agents that searched Mar-a-Lago uh, and 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 I suppose to have threats and 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 hateful attacks leveled against them. So this is a real concern. I'm, I must say I'm really surprised to learn this, that. You go on a grand jury, you do your duty to the country, and you put yourself in a position now where you're a target of threats. And I know, you know it's going to happen. I, if, if the past is prologue, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's a real concern.